only go towards new items. So for example, um, you guys approved the accessibility swing that's at Briar Park now, um, and that was installed last month, and that was paid for through these park mitigation funds. So our proposal really is that we start using up some of those funds um, with designing and engineering something new within the park system, and that's where the, the amphitheater idea came to fruition. The proposed location uh, that we have discussed is really the northeast corner of Briar Park. Um, this picture kind of shows it. it's nearby that area, um, but we we chose this photo just to show the existing topography in that area. It already has a natural grade for festival type seating, so there wouldn't have to be an additional expense with creating some sort of seating or tiered seating. It's actually got a really nice grade. We spent some time out there and did some measuring and, and looking around and it's already got really nice feel for if we had a stage or an amphitheater down there for the community to be able to sit out in that area. And then this slide, it's um, an aerial view of the, the area that we're talking about. One of the other benefits of having it in this particular spot is that it's close to public works and it already has that access road. So for construction or even once the structure is built, the ease of getting equipment back to the stage area would be really, you know, would be really easy with that access road. But being close to public works, we know electrical is going to be needed in this area and maintenance and that sort of thing, having it so close to that um, building, we feel is actually a, a really good benefit. Some examples of amphitheaters um, in Washington state, most of these are on in Western Washington, except for Icicle Creek. Um, Hunter Hendrickson, which many of you know, who, who is really instrumental in starting music in the park. He is um, you know, an active band member. I think he has like five gigs even just this month. He you know, helped figure out what are good aspects of having an amphitheater, what are benefits and drawbacks in terms of how to build it effectively. And these were a few that we chose. You know, The top one is Cromwell Park in, in Shoreline. Icicle Creek is the one um, in the top right-hand corner. Willis Tucker Park out in Snohomish is the bottom left. And then Francis Anderson Center in downtown Edmonds is the one in the bottom right-hand corner. And the two that really stuck out to us that could really work in Briar Park would be the Icicle Creek Center design paired with the, like the Willis Tucker Park design, something kind of in between the two of those. So what we would suggest in terms of what the design would be is having an elevated stage to increase the visibility and, and expand the reach of the sound of whoever's playing up there or if it's a theatrical performance that the sound goes outward. Um, and we would use a pervious surface to avoid any stormwater issues. So for example, um, the second picture that's there on the bottom of the screen that's all out of Trex decking and it's got, you know, wooden trellis in the front. That would be more what we would need to go with versus the Willis Tucker Park example, which is all concrete. And um, as I mentioned, our park board kind of met in the field there, a few of us at least, and um, we did some measuring. Um, it's, we feel like a 30 by 20 foot performance area would meet the needs of a large band or, or performance group. Um, that large slanted roof, which you can see in this particular example in Willis Tucker Park, really gives that, um, it directs the sound outward. So if there's the, you know, there's houses right behind that area in the park, we wouldn't want the sound to go back at to, out to their houses. But if you um, build it a certain way, like in this particular picture, the sound can go outwards towards the park. And it could also help with weather and directing, you know, covering the performance area adequately. We'd also suggest um, for a design element to have that back wall, which you can see in this picture as well. There's that back wall there, as well as the partial open sidewalls. 
to pr protect the performance area from weather, to house the electrical outlets, direct sound forward, um, offer storage, and then create that offstage space for um, things not to be visible to the audience. So let's say, you know, the high school orchestra wants to rent out the space and put on a performance. They can put their, um, you know, their cases for their instruments behind that wall and not have it clutter their stage. Or if it's a theatrical performance, the costume changes can happen be behind that wall. We'd also want a storage closet um, with a circuit panel option in there, and then um, ample GFCI outlets, power, power, power. We definitely need to have lots of um, electrical as well as lighting options and um, you know, just have it have the design really include all of those, even if we don't have enough funding maybe for lights at this time, have it something where we can add lights at a later point. And uh, lastly, we really want to make the park accessible to all. So um, this is an old rendering. This is something from like the, the website currently that shows what the original plan was for Briar Park and having this amphitheater out in that northeast corner. Um, so it's not quite drawn to scale, but um, you know, though we would want to see some sort of ADA wheelchair access with an asphalt pad from the access road. I know there's this path that kind of winds around here as well, so maybe maybe it could be off of the path too, or, or something like that. Um, we'd want the stage to have a ramp for access um, for for wheelchair access, and then um, we highlighted this area. We feel like it would be worth it to also have some gravel parking spots over in that area. So for presenters or anyone who's um, offloading equipment, they have a place off the access road to kind of put their cars and, and park there, just a couple spaces there. And, you know, potentially maybe some food truck options, uh, you know, a place for food trucks to, to go over on that side of the, um, the park when they normally are kind of in the baseball field area. So again, why an amphitheater? Um, ultimately, it satisfies the original master plan for the park. And we, we feel like it fits the need um, for the park mitigation funds. It's something new. It's going to bring uh, you know, community involvement to another level. And um, we just think it's, a, it's one of the best ideas that we could come up with as um, something exciting to add to one of our parks. And lastly, we would love to be involved in the project. I know we've got a couple people, um, not only I know John Lockhart is, is an active musician, but um, I know Hunter is a, is a musician and uh, there's a, a few of us that would like to, to stay involved with helping with the design or any other aspects um, as you approve uh, this potential project for the future. So that is our presentation. And uh, if there's any questions, there are a few of us on the call to answer any. All right, thank you, Kristen. Any questions for the park board? I'm jumping in. I've been on the parks board for many, many, many years as a liaison. Uh, I love the idea. We've talked about this for ages. Um, but Kristen, I mean, I know this is preliminary, but any idea, I mean, I'm rolling some numbers in my head, but they're rough numbers. Of the construction cost of that structure, I mean, is any ideas? I mean, I know we're we're early, but you know that's always the number that's going to ask the council is going to ask. You know, yeah, we we don't know, but we know design is going to be a a chunk of change, and so it may be a few years out before even construction could even be possible. Um, and we know that we know there's a certain amount of funds available and that might get eaten up pretty quickly uh, with, especially with all those requests that we <laughs> we would like to see. Uh, but I don't have any particular numbers. We haven't done anything beyond just scoping it's, it. Yeah, I know, I like, I like it though, but you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. All right, good question. Anybody else? Oh, hi, Kristen, I heard you, Don Moran, I, I heard you use the word rent. So I, I'm, I'm anticipating that you would see this as being something that would be uh, 
uh, a venue available to people at a charge, which might be available to help offset the cost of building or at least maintaining the unit? In my opinion, I think so. <laughs> I think it's rentable. Um, that would be, I, I think it's probably even more expensive than what we would charge for our uh, gazebo within that park. Right. Yeah. So I would say it, there's rental income available for from that. And do you anticipate it being restricted to just entertainment? So for instance, uh, families that want to use the, the unit for birthday parties or uh, private uh, knitting circles or whatever, would it be an extension of the existing picnic stand that we have there in the park? Or would this be just for entertainment only or community events only? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We hadn't explored that. Um, I wouldn't see why not. I would have to kind of defer, uh, I, depending on the design of it, um, if it would fit, it might, I, I don't know how tables would get up there or something like that for for like a birthday party. There's already tables at the gazebo and that sort of thing, but maybe based off of the cost of rental. Yeah, okay. I, I, and I have two other it questions. It could be worked out that Public Works is able to put some tables up there and have those removed. Yeah, okay. I have two other questions, but I don't want to hog the, if, if others- Go ahead, to... Don. Go ahead, Don. So, so the other question would be, um, uh, there's like four or five houses there that would be abutting the back of the stand. And I'm presuming that we would have to get the permission of those homeowners if, if in fact the stand is going to be used where there's music at different times of day, maybe, maybe troubling to some of the folks living next door. So- I would, would defer to you guys maybe on that one. Um, oh, I mean- okay. I, I know I, in terms of like a, uh, it's been talked about with a, like a dog park. And I know that people yeah. have been against that idea. Yeah. Um, I'll just I, say it's one of the things that was on my items. Of, I think that, so where you said the parking and I get kind of the idea, um, the reason those bushes are shown there or trees was to also recognizing it it is on the other side of the road which was very conscious to try to keep the distance to a level to one uh and then also trying to help add some of the other uh sound uh you know things but it takes time for trees to grow and all that but uh it is something i have on my list on that we we would absolutely want to make sure that there's yeah. communication with the neighbors yeah. uh from the early on and then i think even things like i've gotten my notes for just future reference would be you know a sound engineer people i mean open sides will let the sound go more at leak out so especially on the one side there may be some things that can be done to help mitigate but we yeah. would definitely want to take the neighbors into consideration they don't have to approve it but we also don't want to have uh you know make bad neighbors ourselves yeah definitely um and then my last question i'll go back to your opening remarks unfortunately it's the elephant in the room but as much as i love the idea and in fact i i was sharing this with my uh, uh my significant other here last night who, who was also very excited about the idea but the first thing she said to me was what about the bathrooms how are you going to do with all the people who are coming to this event because there's only two two toilets there in the bathroom and and they're not the most elegant devices to use for the existing crowd that we have. So is, is there funding available for actually upgrading or creating new bathrooms to adjoin this potential unit? Probably not out in that area. I mean, I would love to see the bathrooms updated in Briar Park anyways. Um, I haven't heard of it that being an issue when we've done music in the park or other large events in terms of like you know, lines or yeah, any any issues with the actual facility itself. Um, I'm not seeing this as like a huge like more than what we normally have in attendance at music in the park. I don't I don't I don't foresee that, but you never know. It could grow into yeah something. Yeah. All right, great questions. Anything else? Well, I'll just a couple of things. I don't know how much question, just some observations. And obviously this gets farther down path. These things are kind of more into play. Uh, I, you know, ultimately, yes, this has been on the books for a long time. I think it is definitely more, has more appeal than the dog park, things like that. And it is isolated events uh, from that standpoint. So that's good. Uh, just some things I, I've already mentioned the, about the uh, sound engineer. Whenever we get to that, I think that'll be part of the architecture uh, is important uh, yeah. on that front. Uh, you mentioned the power and absolutely power for these things. Uh, you'll want 220 in there uh, because if somebody brings in their sound equipment, a lot of that stuff will run on 220 
Uh, you're not trying to create a whole rock band and uh, you know how we end up measuring volume will be something important and and the lighting certainly i you know i don't have a problem with that you know the, the scaffolding up there that you know you can mount the lighting to if people want to bring it in but they are expensive and you wouldn't want to leave them up uh all the time or they're going to get damaged um and the other thing was just your comments about uh the food trucks uh well, actually, there's two. One on the food trucks, get Y down lower. Might to, we see if there might be another spot to do it, just because it can be distracting if it's kind of tucked back there, I suspect, with the band and people watching. And finally, the, you, you mentioned the ADA. I suspect that we should at least have a front row of seats that would be for more, maybe some of the more elderly folks that would like to come. Um, and, you know, they're not going to probably want to be comfortable sitting on that grass. Um, I don't know ultimately what the bench is. Um, I, you know, it was interesting because I took me a month to go, where's Icicle Creek's one? Because I'm familiar with the one at the ski hill in Leavenworth, which is where they do the sound of music and all that. I had to look up it. It's not quite as uh, the same type of stage. But uh, anyway, those are just things going forward. But um, I mean, I'm open to continued discussion and looking at how this might go forward. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, just two questions from me. Uh, Kristen, what orientation were you thinking of um, directing the theater in? Sort of up towards up the hill towards the play area or more parallel towards the skate park? I think it more towards the, the play towards area slash baseball field. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Okay, so more southwest. Yeah. Yes. And not south south. Correct. Okay. I was just yeah. curious. So and and essentially even that sound, it would just kind of go kind of up the hill mm -hmm. towards the and playground. there's more hill for seating in that area too. I wondered if you'd also looked at um despite the additional distance from public works, if you'd looked at the area um, right up the hill from the state park, um, also considering concerns around um, adjacent property owners, that would be a few hundred feet further away from their houses. It, the place, are you talking about where between like the path that goes with the bench and then the state park? Yeah, like directly west of the state park, pointing up the hill towards the baseball field. Yeah, that we hadn't. There's quite a few trees in there, and um, you know that would probably cost a lot more to cut that down. And I don't. This I thought there was like a drain field through there. Yeah, I don't, yeah. that could be. Um, so okay. there's a few few different areas in that that just seemed problematic. But that one grassy area in that one corner seemed kind of like the best. Yeah, best especially option. with the road access for people with a lot of heavy equipment and the ADA mitigation there. So yeah, thank you for your work on this and the presentation, I appreciate it. Thank you. Dan, you got to unmute. Yeah, I have one comment and I, this might, might work when we're talking about the bathroom since this is a new structure and we're using money for the new structure. I'm wondering if we can add, and this might be a big ask and this is up to the architects and the engineering, if we can add bathrooms on the back side of the amphitheater. So we're actually creating a new structure with potentially updated bathrooms and making it um, maybe one bigger unit if there's room, if there's capability. So that might be another way for us to uh, potentially use mitigation funds for something to build something new that actually will benefit much more of the park as well. Highly All unlikely right. you have the funds for both. Oh, okay. Just being upfront about it. Highly Perfect. unlikely you have the funds for both. <laughs> uh, there would be also one would, and again, just things we have to always consider that where that is tucked kind of out of the way, you might have to leave those bathrooms locked when it's not being used because of other problems that can arise. So we've even had it in the main bathrooms, but let alone down there in the corner, even during the day. So that would be something else we'd want to consider. OK, anything else? All right, hearing nothing, I want to thank the parks. I want to thank Kristen and the Parks Board for joining us tonight. Obviously, we're very excited about um, the work that they do and the fact that we're going to get back to normal here and the activities that um, citizens of Briar so much love that the Parks Board is really 
huge part of planning and carrying this out. So we want to thank you and thank you for this presentation. And we will definitely uh, keep this in mind as we um, consider future plans for our parks. So thank you. Hey, can I add Thanks. something? Yes, go ahead. Can Over Street say something? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know me. Right. Okay, I will say, I'll say two things, okay? Paula, when we leave the meeting, I want all of you guys as the, the uh, city council to look in and smile at the Zoom meeting. And <laughs> Paula, you're going to take a screenshot and this is going to be now the official city council picture on the web. <laughs> you know, I have that on my computer at work. How do I do that again, Ken? It's a uh, control window shift S, screen isn't it? or control what, whatever you're usually it's control something print screen. <laughs> it's easy. Good. Somebody can do it and send it to her. <laughs> I, I need I need the um the the part of it that's in between the control and print screen. Hey Ken, can okay. you do Hang that? On, let me get another keyboard and I can tell you exactly. Well, so if you got Windows, I'm way up on this. I can do it for you. Yes, Windows <laughs> Shift. Control. <laughs> Martin, what was that? It, if you have Windows 10, it's Windows Key Shift S. Windows. And then key. you can drag and select the area you want. Val, have you got this? I have that. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. And then the second thing I want to mention is right now the park board, you guys have a really dynamite team working for you. And so as I transition out, I mean, tap them. I mean, they, they really are into putting in some great music projects. The hardest part of doing music in the park is setting up the stage, the venue, and to have this in place and to tap into their resources and their uh, excitement is a, a huge value to this project and to the city itself. So I just wanted to say that also. Well, thank you, uh, thank Ken. You, um, speaking of value, you've provided leadership for, wow, how many, how many years? It's, it's been a long time. So thank you for your leadership on the Parks Board and so many great events that you've been a part of. And um, so I'm sure you're leaving this in good hands and you're always welcome to help us out in Briar. Thank you. Well, you know, I live in East Briar, so I'll always go around. <laughs> Just... No, no, hold on there, Ken. You do remember that we signed you on, right? Paul? Know. Lifetime. He is a, a lifetime honorary member. Yeah. It is in paperwork. The, the plaque, yes. Okay. I have that. Just remember that. I will. No, I'll be around forever. I just won't be in the leadership mode. I All right. won't be obligated. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to move on here. We appreciate all the support and the work. And we're going to move on now to um, review and discuss. Hi, Carla, Kristen, right. and everyone. This is where we leave. And See ya. Right. We're going to review and discuss city fee schedule, proposed changes. That's not as quite as exciting as considering a change to our park. But before we do that, hang on. I need to eliminate me. And so I know there's a way to picture. Do I don't yeah. know. I've been skiing all day. Can we do it yeah. next time? Yeah. <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys want to do it next week when you're prepared and you've got your hair done and everything? We can we can do it we next do week it. so that you can all I'm be humble. Done. <laughs> My hair is done. So, <laughs> say that, Johnny. You know, I'm we want to talk to you about that. Okay, we'll do it next week. I'm going to let you. Eric in the meeting. And we can get all of our lighting just perfect. Oh, yeah. Right. Everybody like, work on your lighting. Soft lighting. Now and and next week. <laughs> get the camera just right. Right? I'm sorry. Okay. Here comes Eric. Okay, Eric, you gotta unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. How about that? There we go. Eric, Nobody. welcome, welcome to the meeting. Um, I think all of you know that I, since becoming mayor, I've caught the Air, Eric Beverly disease. That means that when it rains hard, I wake up in the middle of the night and worry about things. <laughs> that's because that's what Eric does on. He only not only worries about it, he gets out of bed and starts driving around the city looking for problems. 
So I haven't got that far yet. I just wake up and worried and he actually gets out of bed and does stuff. So tonight we're talking about, we're discussion of city fee schedule that are proposed changes. And uh, Eric has been the one taking the lead on this and um, I'm gonna let him explain what he found and what he recommends. Well, I think the memo, if, if you had a chance to read it, kind of goes over what the surrounding cities are charging for fees at this time. Um, I compared Lake Forest Park, Woodway, Terrace, and Linwood as examples while comparing these. And that's been the pretty much the trend and I've been doing this for quite a while, since about 2007. So these have been the cities that we mostly use for comparisons. Keeping in mind that these cities all have a lot of commercial business and gets a lot of commercial revenue pumped into the city. And thus that is reflected on our, kind of on our end, where we don't have that, where a bedroom community and those funds are ours are a little bit uh, they're a little bit uh, comparable, I guess. But I don't know that they sustain the the city staff itself in each department. Uh, I've consorted with. Uh, Marysville, Mount Lake Terrace, and uh, Katrina Anders used to work for the city of Briar, and she was a big help last year when I was was putting together the figures. And she's always preached that we should be charging a lot more than what we are charging on the user fee end, and I tend to agree because of the fact that we don't have any commercial. And uh, the city's fee schedules normally charge the commercial a little more than what they would the residential construction. So um, the administrative fees that's, that you see in here was put together by Paula. And uh, of course, the police chief also contributed a bit with this. So I guess we get on, get on with it, eh? Um, I took a comparison of the building or valuation fees from each city and compiled them up to be an average of $6,775.47 for a project of $500,000. And we were in the hole of that average by $434. So every new house that we, we've built in this time frame, which this hasn't been updated since 2007, the uh, valuation table, um, we've lost we've lost revenue by not charging enough. I I'm sorry, I, I don't have it organized for what I'm trying to get to here and uh, I'm deviating from the fee schedule. But uh, in a nutshell, if you take a look at the fee schedule itself, It's, it reflects a 5% a raise in the valuation table. And on page one, there was a typo on that. We missed it by uh, six, uh, a total for a $500,000 project with 5% would uh, be 66.5791. That would only put us in the hole, so to speak, eight, 118.56. Uh, 
on a $500,000 project. All the homes that we're building right now, they're over that 500,000 mark. As far as valuation goes, based on the adopted ICC building valuation data, which is a national computer based figures. So, and I think right now it's about $125 per square foot on new homes and remodeled homes for with that's putting additions on. So I think that the 5% increase in the valuation table is justified. We've also, some of the staff members heard about the 5% uh, electronic uh, fee per, five, per permit. That permit fee, I checked and a lot of those surrounding cities use mybuildingpermit.com to do their building permits for them and they have to pay a fee. So that 5% covers that digital fee that they're doing throughout their city. I didn't, I didn't ask council to consider that in the memo that I wrote because I, I'm not sure that the auditor would, would approve that. Um, they would. Yeah, I'm not but sure. That's why I was a little hesitant and adding it because of all of our stuff that we are you know we're always having to upgrade servers and we're paying for cloud storage and we're doing things like that the five percent fee if the council wanted to consider it could be justifiable for you know adding to all the projects because we you know we we have lots of stuff that goes along with it that all has to do with technology Paula, yes. and Eric, I'm just going to jump in for a second here, but you know, you mentioned 5% and are we going to be like, be doing this here another year or two? I mean, are we, is 5%, should we, should it be more? I mean, I don't like to add more, but I mean, it seems like it's kind of incremental enough. I mean, should it, we be thinking further ahead? I don't know. Paula and Eric, what do you think? I think that um, in my case, I haven't worked with council, this council enough. I knew the, the newer members here are, are probably, this is the first time that they've been uh, involved in this. And previous administration kind of frowned on raising these, uh, these fees. So we've, we've done fee study, studies every year but this, this particular one hasn't changed since 2019 totally that, and I know in, I know that you are supposed to have this from staff in February to review. And I apologize for it slipping my mind at that point, we had a lot going on at the time. And it was something that we normally wait for the UBI to come out to kind of look at, but it didn't happen. So we're looking at it now. All right. Thank and, you, Eric. And I, instead of doing this thing, if I were and drawing this whole thing out, I'd like to go just to the fee schedule, if you would. I've highlighted in in red the uh, this is the current fee schedule, and I've taken some things out like the business license for 30 days, 60 days. Uh, and uh, the event business license fee we had to take out because we're doing this all through the state now instead of in, you know, the individuals coming into the office for their, uh, for their permit or their business license. Um, if you drop down to police administration fees, this fee didn't get changed the last time that we did a fee schedule update and the hourly 
fee was $75. We asked that, that we bump that to 125 an hour. That would be concurrent with what we have asked for a raise from $100 to 125 for land use fees per hour. And what's I think what's important about this is that our whole land, land use and planning is done on an hourly basis. We've, uh, the current average is over $150 on our surrounding, um, there was only three that does an hourly wage or hourly fee. And that was a hundred and I think $156, if I remember right, is what the average from the three cities that was compared. And we're at staff's asking for $125 an hour raise. Uh, subdivisions. Hey, Eric, when did we when did we last set that hourly rate on the uh, hearing and fees? I think, was, I think it was 2017, Martin, or okay. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds right to me as well. Yeah, okay. And we took it up from, what was that? Was it 75? It was or at 75. Yeah. yeah. And technically, at the time when we did it and increased it, uh, when we ran the numbers, staff really wanted it to go higher than the hundred Staff always wants to hire. <laughs> right. Well, we've been trying to figure out the right balance, but yeah. Right. But the thing, you know, the thing of it is, is staff, it's supposed to cover staff time, you know, our, the wages, the benefits, everything in conjunction and $75 was not cutting yeah, it. it and we were, be, no. we were actually over a hundred, but came to the hundred dollar mark because of, you know, being told that we should only ask for a hundred. Well you, well, you base hourly wage plus benefits into that, and you're well over that hundred dollar mark now. So I don't believe it's a. Of course, I'm the one recommended it, but I don't believe it's a an overreach compared to the cities around us. Like I said, that's over a hundred and fifty dollar average for them. Not always apples to apples to them, but I I get it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you, Eric. Other questions for Eric? Are, have you got more to present? Well, if you want me to go through the the total fee schedule and try to explain, but yeah, go, council go ahead. feels confident that they've read it and are don't have any questions. I'll sit well, let's back do, and, let's, let's do this. Let's let the council. You guys have all seen this. Do you have specific yeah. questions? Uh, I, uh, Don Moran here, Eric. I have I have two questions. So I, I'm I'm the newest member. What would be helpful to me is <clears throat> as I went through this, understanding <clears throat> that valuation table itself on page one. Uh, you know, you have some things listed there as subtotals, <clears throat> permit fees, and reviews. I'm assuming that's a permit a building permit for a new property of some valuation of approximately half million dollars, and that's my assumption. So if you could just explain to me each of those columns. That would be helpful. And then my second question would be that based on the fees that you've looked at, these are all in the public domain. So there's nothing, uh, um, I guess, uh, competitive here, competitive information we're trying to conceal from anyone. I, I, I'm, I'm going to assume, or should I, I'll just ask, you looked at these fees and they're pretty much comparable to what Linwood and Mount Lake Terrace and other cities are also charging? Or are we, are we going to be an outlier to any of those other surrounding communities with these new fee adjustments? Uh, for the valuation table, we're still under the average uh, by $118. Okay, so if we look at the valuation table, you have a couple of columns there. And Paula, maybe if you, if you wanted to share the screen, we could all take a look at it. But you have a column called valuation. There's a base fee, um, something I think multi-table, then a subtotal column, then a permit fee, and then a review, and then a total fee. And I just didn't understand what each of those buckets really were. Well, you'd have to refer back to the first page of the, the fee schedule. Whereas 
the uh, valuation table in there gives you a formula to figure these out. So uh, it's the ones you put in yellow, right, Dennis? I mean, Dennis, sorry, Eric. It's the table that has the yellow with the 5% raise is what that yellow highlight is. But just if you're trying to zero uh, in on which where the valuation table, it'll be the page five, I think. Is it five in the PDF? Um, lines eight through 15, I think, on page five. Can you guys yeah, see uh, my screen? Yes. 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 Yeah, it's right stop, Paula, right there. Okay. So the, yeah, so the valuation table is line seven. So if you go down to, oh man, this is really blurry on my end. If, oh. There. There Does that go. help? Does that help? Thank yeah. you. So line 13. It says for the first $100,000, it's $1,187.37. Further read on, for each additional thousand or fraction thereof, is you add another $6.64. So on your base table, Um, are you on the Excel sheet or are you on the first page of the memo? I'm on the memo. I don't, I don't have an Excel sheet. So, um, maybe, maybe I just, no, so I tell you, if you scroll it, down in the doc, yeah, it's, page five, it's, yeah, okay. it's down a bit. Yeah. Okay. So I, each one of the cities, Linwood, for example, is at the top of that valuation table in the menu memo. At 500,000, their base fee is based on the same type of formula we have in this valuation table on line 13 of the fee schedule. So it's, it's saying the multiple, that is because we're taking, we're taking uh, thousands and dividing it by 500,000 which is 500,000, then we're subtracting the original $100,000 because you're already paying for it in the 1187.13. Does that, does that make sense? Um, so if you looked at, so here's the way, so if you look at the valuation table, the one that's on the first page, and we'll just talk about Briar. Right. And you see a number, the subtotal that says 2,656. I do believe if you divide that by the 400, which is a thousand increments, 400, so you get to $400,000, but the table here is for every thousand over a hundred thousand, right? Or uh, in this case, then there's a base on there. But if you divide the 400 in the 2656, you'll get that $6.64 number uh, that uh, was being talked about. And because we're valuating at it 500,000, so that's in the 100 to 500,000 is what Eric did there. And okay. this was an original formula or format that was in the uh, uniformed uh, administrative code from 1997. Uh, ICC picked it up also with a uh, multiple based on where you're, wherever you, whatever state you were in, there was a multiple because of the national figure behind it. But as far as the, the anything over, let's say the, the original first hundred thousand, as we're talking about uh, the 500,000 base, then it's multiplied by that 400 after you divide it by that 100 and then your 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 fee would be um, one or excuse me two thousand six hundred and fifty six or excuse me three thirty eight thirty eight forty three and then plan review fee uh, code is sixty five percent of the building permit fee. 
So the total would come out to 63.41.16. Eric, and that's still $118 off the Comp City's average, is that correct? Yes, I only brought it 5% because it was a round number. I thought, honestly, I didn't know what to think. I'm, I'm not used, I don't know what your wishes are at this point so and at least historically I, we go oh, ahead yeah i think our wishes are to be fair to the city and be fair to the citizens and comparing ourselves to other local cities is valid in finding that we are typically below considering we don't have commercial um yeah i think your analysis is good and the changes that you're recommending or something yeah. that we need and to the five percent would put us kind of in the middle. We wouldn't be the highest. Right. We wouldn't be the lowest. Put us smack in the middle. I, I, as I looked at it, I thought the five percent was reasonable. I'm not so sure I'm ready for the other electronic fee right now. But uh, the five percent, I thought Eric, the way you slotted it in, um, you kind of that's kind of traditionally where we'd been, and that's where you targeted it. It's been five years on or three years on this one, I think. Well, um, this one here hasn't been changed since 2007. Was it seven? What yes. was the 2019? Oh, I guess I mixed up the. Uh, we didn't change it. the fees in this particular portion uh, of the fee schedule. Okay. So, <laughs> well, we've helped I mean, up if well, you then. look at the UPI, I went in and looked at the base from the UPI from 2007 to now, it was like 43 and a half percent. And I'm sure you don't want to raise the fee to. <laughs> 43 percent so but the valuations of the homes are going up so high that we're getting additional funds that way because the valuations are now as you noted a million dollar type home valuations so but we're not getting that as far as the fee goes that's an actual price what what the valuation is based on is the national average per square oh, foot yeah. oh that's what you were talking about with the other we can't use the you're going off the 125 contractor average per square foot building Cost, yeah. Right? yeah. Well, the actually, if uh, we get down in here, and well, and the building permits actually adopts the ICC uh, building valuation data. So in 1504 of the municipal code, we actually use that as an evaluation table. So it tells you what per square foot of a R3, uh, five uh, building cost per square foot average throughout the United States. So we're kind of getting uh, a little break here because we know that the cost of living in the Northwest is a monthly higher than anywhere else in the nation, except maybe San Francisco and LA new york so okay any further questions for eric one question eric yes sir and I'll, as we go time between these evaluations of increases should we be looking at this more consistently especially because of the inflationary factor going on in the country i really think we should and we should not let this go for a long period of time and maybe we do this every year or every other year but I think we need to keep up with it so that we're not losing our, you know what? Well, it's actually in code that the council will re review, the, review the fee schedule in February. Okay, good. We just hadn't touched this section of it. Yeah, we haven't touched this portion for quite a while because we were in the medium there council. And then uh, we were a medium section, but it, like you say, and inflation's caught up with us the last couple of years. And it seems like these surrounding cities have caught on and adjusted their rates to, to meet that inflation. Mr. Gallagher. What's our general revenue? Can we estimate what we expect out of building permits or this, this, area uh, that'd to be a paula question because she's probably got that figure already in her head from the budget that no. was passed <laughs> no i do not because you cannot predict 
when properties will develop. There's no prediction there. So they, what's, it, what's it been running? What's what been running specifically? Uh, what's our revenue been running the last few years? Or do we have any uh, averages or anything? For just building permits? Yeah, the stuff we're talking about here. Hang on. The fees. Any idea? Um, I, mean, I, I can um, log into my finance and tell you. And, and are these per, are these fees for new buildings, or would these fees also apply if a homeowner decides to do a drastic remodel of their existing property? That's all that. They stay within the footprint. This table wouldn't apply, nor would the uh, uh, ICC valuation table. Okay. Normally, we would use an estimate from the uh, contractor for that work. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's what was throwing me off, Eric, was I was thinking of that model for how the valuation, you know, oh, it's going to be this dollar amount on the renovation, and then you get fee. But that is different than the subdivision. I have a few questions, Eric. This cool. is Valerie. Go ahead, Val. Um, so I had a little project about a month ago where I was looking through some of this, so I was excited to see this come through. Um, I do think it's time we increase the number of our fees. And I think some of the suggestions Eric has made are fairly modest. I think it would be fine in some cases to go a little bit higher than he's suggesting as well um, and still remain fair and, and, com and consistent with our neighboring cities. Um, I was looking at impact fees in particular and Briar seems to be pretty much in the average when it comes to park impact fees. Um, however, every other one of the municipalities I looked at, um, except Woodway, um, also charges a street impact fee or a transportation impact fee. And I, these are huge amounts. Mostly it's about $6,000. And knowing the stressors that additional houses put on both our street surfaces and also infrastructure, stormwater, et cetera, I'm curious um, if we've considered looking at adding a transportation impact fee? We used to have them. We had an evaluation done. I, Eric, do you remember what year we had that done in? Oh, they're all running together there, Paula. And yeah, I, me I, too. I but when we had it done, we had to get rid of impact fees and we were told that we would never qualify again because we don't, we won't have the build out and we won't have the added streets and all of that to qualify for it. And on top of that, those funds, those fees that you do get on those street impact fees are also time limited. Yeah. You have to spend them within a six year period. Yes. Or you have to refund them. So in other words, you get a small development, uh, like Vine 13, for example, you collect the fees, you want to widen the road to, to mitigate the extra housing, the city's going to have to come up with a whole bunch of money to do that renovation because those mitigation fees aren't going to be enough to cover the, wide, the widening of the road. And, and you have to use them in the quadrant of the city that they are collected for. So you can't, like you couldn't collect the fees from Vine 13 and use it for something down by Abbey View. It has to be used in the quadrant of that portion of the city. Because we used to have multiple um, street mitigation funds back when I very first started. Right. So it, given that particular example, because we have planned work for Vine, it would have been a fit because we need to do mitigation in that area anyhow, and we're gonna do it within six years. So if, if an impact fee had been possible, then collecting them would have been a good idea in that instance. But in other instances, for example, the one close to the Briar intersection, there isn't any great planned improvement there. And so we would go through the trouble of collecting it only have to return it within six years, after six years. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Okay. 
All right. And then um, I had another question about um, if, if we have plan to make this annual review a little bit more consistent, also following along with what Dennis had said. Um, it looks like a number of our fees have fallen behind um, compatible fees, and I think it would be a good idea to stay up on that. Yeah, yeah. and I, oh, I, I apologize, but oh, I'm just, as, I said I apologize for that. It isn't that the fee study has not been completed in previous years it's it's uh and i'm just a staff member so i i can't do anything about what has happened in the past but i'm bringing you my foremost effort here to be modest and give our citizens something to count on and help sustain the the departments that will that these fees will affect. Yeah, right it's now, really. Right now we're facing, we're almost a build out city, number one. Number two, the housing has been hit pretty hard the last two years with this COVID crap. And we haven't, we've got a supply chain that is out for certain portions of a house that's, uh, Six, six months to a year since they've been ordered and there's the mm -hmm. contractors are still waiting on them. So we're not, we've been, we've been hit hard. Right. Yeah. I didn't mean you to take that as a criticism at all. It was more a note to self that we, I mean, we as a council should look at doing that. I think different fees. I think every year, if just not this particular category, but we have adjusted fees and we've reviewed each year. Um, now people want to look at the bigger number again, you know, each year, but we, it, we have been looking at it each year, even last year. Right. Understood. Okay. Um, my other question was pertaining to the technology fee that, um, Paula and Eric both mentioned in my survey. I did notice that most of the cities do charge between two and a half and 5% either on all permit fees or some permit fees. And that does also seem like a good way to offset the additional technological costs to our business. So um, I would like to see us investigate that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Other questions? I have some numbers for you all now, if you'd like. Oh, them. Thanks, Paula. This is just for new construction, what we collected over the last three years. In 2019, we collected 18,353 dollars for building permits. We collected in 2020, $47,293. And in 2021, we collected 29510 So it's, it's a number that's hard to predict. Thanks, Paul. It, it, is, it is totally hard to predict. Yeah. That's, that, that's why I said to begin with, no, nope. <laughs> no, no prediction for me. It, I, I pull a number out of my rear and I plug it into the budget and I cross my fingers and hope we hit it. We had one year when all those houses off of uh, Briar Road got built, uh, all, we were, I want to say 100K high. I mean, it was a yeah, big number. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing is but that it was... I go, I'll go in and I'll talk to like Eric and Steve and uh, Jennifer to find out what projects we have coming and approximately how many homes they are do we think they're gonna get you know the project built out enough to start building homes? Do we think they'll build homes this year? Will they maybe only build half the homes? And so you know, I it's it's all a guessing game, and I I pretend to know um, what I'm guessing at. Okay, other questions for Eric? All right, hearing none, I want to thank Eric for his contribution, and obviously. If you think of further questions that you don't understand, feel free to call Eric um, and just to talk about these things. This is why we have a workshop and something might occur to you, a question, please feel free to give him a call or send him an email. But I wanna thank Eric, anything, anything else from you, Eric? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, for getting me off the hook. I appreciate that. <laughs>
Thanks for your hard work, Eric. We appreciate it. It is so much work, just the little bit that I did. Thank you for your effort. Yes, he has the he has just the right. Um, yeah, he's the right person for the job. And so exactly, we're so, we're so happy. We're so happy that he's here with us. So, all right, moving on to review of proposed code changes in zoning divisions. Um, so tonight we're going back to talk about stuff that we've talked about many times before. And uh, uh, Jennifer's with us tonight and we've made some changes and she's gonna outline those changes and then talk about where we're at. Go ahead, Jennifer, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we have continued our work. Hopefully this is the last of it and we can take these changes to the planning commission at the April meeting and for their public hearing. Um, the latest changes we identified um, relate to the uh, 1736050. This is the section that talks about variances and conditional use permits. That again, there are some things that have occurred to us as we've reviewed many applications, but uh, some of these specifically came to mind during the recent situation with uh, Mr. Miata's application for a conditional use permit for his SDU. So that kind of pushed these to the forefront. Um, changes that I am recommending uh, in section C2 to remove the requirement to provide a landscape plan uh, during the conditional use permit application. It can be deferred to the point of when the building permit is issued and it's much easier to review the landscape plan at that time when they know what is actually being proposed and where. And then uh, to revise the requirements to state that the applicant provides conceptual floor plans and elevations. Uh, this allows them to submit their application sooner and feel confident that they will they have permission to build a secondary dwelling unit before they make a major investment in design time. And then adding language that the city can require additional information to review the proposal. You know, this is just good housekeeping language and would also cover the city if we get an application for a conditional use permit for something along the lines of the fire station that was reviewed a number of years ago where you are gonna need substantially more information for the council to make a determination about the suitability of that project for Briar. Um, then moving along to C9, adding language to extend the period of time by which the applicant must quote unquote establish use for a conditional use permit or variance. And then um, adding a definition that basically equates the issuance of the permit is the threshold for establishing use for a conditional use permit. Currently, it says that the applicant needs to substantially complete construction, which is, has posed problems, not just for Mr. Miata, but previous applicants as well. And then um, also adding language to say state the director may extend the period for establishing use as long as they keep their building permit you know, in good order and consult regularly with the building official and have the inspections as required through the building permit process. So I'd be glad to go into uh, more detail on any of these uh, areas if you have questions, but I would suggest that we bring these forward to the planning commission at the public hearing at, in April. Thank you, Jennifer, any questions? Wow. I'm still on the mute button, sorry. Okay, Val. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, thanks for this, Jennifer, it was really thorough. Um, <clears throat> I had a question around the definition of um, imperme impervious surfaces. Okay, that definition that comes one. from the Washington Stormwater Manual, and that's why we're updating that to the to the current definition that's provided in the manual. Um, in specific, like I understand that might be the standard definition. In specific, like. It seems weird to me that we would be talking about, um, it's on line 122, uh -huh. um, it being a non-vegetated surface area. 
That, that is the definition the Washington stormwater manual uses and we want to be consistent with that terminology and document. Okay. So, yeah. Other questions? There was one other one. I wondered if in the non-conforming use, if the definition you had there um, extends to include um, non-conforming uses that are expanded or intensified. I've seen that in other code and I wondered if that was addressed. So like what would be an example of that? The one I saw called out Um, expanding, increasing to occupy a greater area of building or land without a without any permit from the city. So you, I can follow up with you Al, on that. Did you that see that uh, lines three uh, thirty six through three forty, which talks about expansion? Three thirty six. That's exactly it. Sorry, I overlooked it. My apologies. All right. Okay. Good Happy question. To see if I answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Val. Any other questions for Jennifer? All right. Once again, um, if you have something that comes to mind, please feel free to contact Jennifer. It's our plan to bring this before you. Uh, actually, next next is Planning Commission, right? Right, so hopefully they will make a recommendation to bring this back to you in the form of an, an ordinance, but um, definitely if there's any concerns, it's definitely better if you bring them, you know, preferably before the planning commission, but, you know, even prior or to that or after that, but not at the night of the, the meeting. <laughs> it yeah. can lead to some, you know, questions that we don't necessarily have time to think of all the ramifications from implementing those changes on the fly. Perfect, all right. Hearing nothing else, we'll move on to item number five, review bond release for request of um, Briar Landing. Jennifer is with us on that one too tonight. Do you wanna to explain what's going on there, Jennifer? Uh, sure, um, I don't have the paperwork in front of me, but the, um, original applicant for Briar Landing sold the project to a new developer, Solo 51 LLC. So uh, Solo 51 LLC has submitted new permits in their name and new bonds in their name. So we would like to release the bonds from the original developer, Quantum, Quantum Homes, so that he can get his money back. And he has satisfied everything that remains for him to do on the project. Any questions about Briar Landing? I got one. Yeah. Now I know we've transferred this property owning this this whole job to someone new. And I think everyone can tell us going up and down Briar Road what's going on. I mean, I just want a darn good assurance because we just paved that road not too long ago <laughs> that they can put that road back to where it was. Because right now it's you know what. Yeah. No. Uh, Steve goes there every day. I, I know. And that whole thing is being torn up. And obviously what you're driving over, the steel plates and the temporary paving, that's all going to go away and will definitely be all, because that's an important uh, location in our city. So yes, rest assured that we will be watching that to make sure it's done correctly. Uh, and it's, it's a significant amount of cutting in our major roads. So we will thank you. It's a good question. We'll definitely be on that. And if, thank, if I can you. add, when they apply for their, when they're complete, they've completed their plat improvements and they apply for final plat, the resolution that will come to council, you know, for their approval of the final plat would outline any specific bonds and releases and be able to, you know, have another look at that to make sure that the, all of those things were adequately covered. Just want my smooth road back. Yeah. All right. Yes, very important. All right. If there's nothing else, thank you, Jennifer. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Okay, All right. Chair. Thank you. We're moving on to review the bid for precision concrete cutting sidewalks, tripping hatch repair. We've been through this before where we get grants um, to allow us to help reduce tripping hazards. Um, the corp company has come through and evaluated our, our tripping hazards and they specifically outlined those. You saw that in the document you received. And so part of it, we pay for and part of it's through a grant and we're just here tonight to just see if you have any questions about those bring in steve into the no steve's not here oh this is a different steve on the call <laughs> so if you have any if you have I, I, any I, I just oh steve will be here i'll just ask him but no if you have any hard here. questions paula will answer them uh, these these are all the little blue marks I've seen on the sidewalks. Uh, right. Yep. Cheaper to repair than lawsuits. Yep. Well, I gotta say. Uh, my oh, Paul, is, is, Paul is talking. We can't hear her. That's just kind of yeah, nice. Actually. Hold on. Unmute. Um I said we got the ten thousand dollar grant again. So yes. that's a benefit. So yeah. Yeah. The our our insurer looks fondly upon this kind of thing yes. so i didn't oh, quite under i didn't quite understand how the invoice has been prepared there's there's this number and is this did the numbers in the far left column correspond to the sidewalk slot that has been appointed so to speak for this fixture or is this a, a total number of of uh yeah, I, I don't know what, what the numbers mean. Um, so, and then, and then we have lineal feet and inch feet. When I've looked at the numbers right. to figure out what we're spending per foot, it's not, at least from my math, not matching what I see as the going rate for doing concrete cutting, just when I, when I use the, the good old Google search engine to figure out what the Keep cost Keep in is. mind, we're government. We don't get to pay what you Google. We have to pay prevailing wage. We don't. No, that's ever. fine, but this is this is a yeah. multiple of what I see as as the Google uh, prevailing wage. So that's I, I just don't understand yeah. how the numbers are are determined. What's a lineal yeah. foot versus an inch foot? Um, Steve, is that you? If it is, will you raise your hand and I'll bring you into the meeting? That four hundred. He understands minutes? that part better than I do. Yeah, that's not then. So twenty-two thousand dollars divided by four hundred and fifty lineal feet is forty-four dollars per linear foot for a concrete cutting, as I calculate it. Well, and well, if you look that's at not it, we, square feet though, <laughs> right? And we in, and we increased the dollar amount, you know, that we would bring to you to have approved, so that we have wiggle room because otherwise you get to the point where they're out there actually doing the work. And if it ends up being more feet and more inches than what the prediction was, just because of however the topography is and everything, um, if we don't have that extra built into there, then they hit that spot where they've spent all our money and we have to look at them and go, you can't do anymore because we don't have authorization. And so then part of the work doesn't get done. And there's a difference between concrete cutting and concrete grinding. Right. right. This is grinding. So right. we're grinding yeah. the we're grinding okay. the corner. We're not cutting. We're grinding the corners off of the. No, I get okay, it. That I, was I, my question. I get it. No, I, I understand. I understand that. I get it. But I still don't understand how the how the lineal foot inch foot is is interpret, interpreted into a cost per per unit, so to speak. And and the numbers on the side of that far left margin, forty three three seven three four four five. I don't, I don't know what they mean. I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. So I, I'm not going to tell you I get it either. So what yeah. I'd recommend, Don, is you could call, call, call or email call Steve. Steve. Okay. Mm -hmm. Steve will be able to explain that part of it because I, I don't get that deep into it either. Yeah, I think yeah. that the one on the left is just the location and the it is. and the amount of cutting is a combination of the depth and width. The sidewalks are four and a half or five feet. So they got to grind so much off and it's going to move back so far. So it's just a, it's just a calculation of the actual yeah. amount of grinding they're going to do. Yeah, right. they must take a length Thanks, and then an average depth yeah. or something like that. Yeah, That's yeah. length, well, width, height. 
the volume of concrete they're removing essentially. Yeah, and, and I, I see amounts, concrete removal, two to $6 per square foot is the going rate and concrete cutting about four and a half to seven and a half per square foot. So the numbers just, again, to me as, as a layman don't, don't make the, sense. The, but, the, other, the other thing to consider though, is that there's a difference between grinding linear feet at one shot and picking up your equipment, moving to each location yeah. and, and doing yeah. it. Thanks, yeah. David. I'm no, also concerned about looking into the part, part they suggest a replacement, given the issue we had at Nugget Park. So oh. Right. And Mike, to dovetail onto that, these are listed as recommended replacement, which is the homeowner's responsibility from what I'm reading. So are we obligated to let the homeowner know that we expect them to, to change and, and fix that, that panel in front of their yard? <clears throat> I had that question also. I don't know. Yeah. File uh, fills and replacements are the responsibility of the property owner and are only included for informational purposes only. But if they're a liability, are we are we obligated to let people know that we expect them to fix that? That's a good question. Hang on, okay. Eric. Eric raised his hand. Oh, Eric. Eric, go for it. The RCW protects the homeowner from public right of way uh, mitigation. Uh, I can get that information to you uh, tomorrow when I'm actually at my desk. Yeah, great. Thanks. But, but uh, it, unless it's, it's the sidewalk damage is caused by, let's say, boring cable underneath the sidewalk and the sidewalk fails at that point, then the homeowner is responsible for replacement but our the rcw has a clause in it that that protects the homeowner from from the sidewalk plus the if you want to get into that further the federal highway administration also has rules and regulations that that apply here also that is placed on the city's responsibility it, it protects the homeowner, but it doesn't protect the city from getting a claim filed against them. So then I think um, the city would want to look at replacing those panels. We have in other areas, so it's not it's not unheard of. They, you know, Nugget Park. By the way, my interpretation, well, maybe I got well, the ADA wrong. ramps too down in uh, that we replaced in Briarwood, yeah. for example. We had some some uh, panels replaced because we had a little extra money that went over to the Castle Crest area where the street trees were raising havoc on, on the sidewalk there. So uh, like I said, the, uh, the Federal Highway Administration um, monitors and when President Obama was in office, we had until I think it was 2015 to evaluate our, our sidewalks and put in a priority fix list to, uh, to get you know, maintenance on those sidewalks. Bellevue did it. <laughs> they do their whole, their whole nine yards. And once you find out about these areas that's failing, you have to have like six months to fix them in some cases in a year to fix them and it all falls down onto the city they had nine months of of just calculation after they used a a tarback evaluator to, on the segue to do every sidewalk they had and then they ran into the problem that they were beyond their their limitations of knowing what the uh, damage was and getting it fixed. So it, it, it is a big deal and it's a big liability for the city once we know about it, such as the document that you have in front of you now that Steve put together and the contractor put together. We know about it. If somebody trips and falls, we're liable. Thank you, Eric. 
Sorry for bad news, but you're, you're right. just full of good news tonight, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I appreciate it, Don. I don't want to ruin my reputation of being a hard ass. <laughs> so if you have further questions, uh, this, these are good questions. Please uh, reach out to Steve or Eric. I was just going to note that my interpretation of this had been that the lineal feet was the width of the sidewalk, generally speaking, except for the one that's 11.5, which must be, I don't know if it's along the edge. And then the width, the other number is how wide the grind is. That was my interpretation, but that would make speak, sense. Yeah, mine too. But the eleven five was totally throwing me well, off. So. Yeah, it threw me off, and I tried to find where that was because they looked like even because uh, that's just up around the corner for me. But I was guessing it might have been like where maybe the uh, what do you want to call it? the the AD, the ADA ramp, the wheelchair ramp kind of thing is, and maybe that curved around and it was all lifted on the corner or something like that. That was just my guess. Okay. One question for me. This is for the north side of the city. Um, you mentioned it's been done before, and then we know that Nugget Park has pristine and beautiful sidewalks. Um, is there a, were we to do this again, does it just rotate to different quadrants of the city when we have a grant? Yeah, two years ago, we did the south end of the city. Okay. All right. Hearing nothing else, we're going to move on to... Item number seven, review and discuss contract for police lieutenant. Nick's coming in. Tonight, um, we have with us our police chief since he gets on here. Thank you, Eric, by the way. All right, Nick, if you can unmute yourself. All right, there's our chief. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate uh, all the things you're doing for our department. And um, uh, yes, and we're excited to talk about this new proposed contract position for a lieutenant. And so take it away, Nick. Okay, well, uh, thank you. This has been a great uh, listening to your guys' discussion. It's been really, uh, really informative. Uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> Warned you. <laughs> and this is not a margarita, so yeah. Anyway, it should be. Neither's mine. <laughs> it should be. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so uh really excited to bring this contract before you guys tonight. And uh to you know, I'm excited to bring it forward because this this is about momentum. This is about building our department into uh being a agency that is that is just going to be stronger and better. And with that is leadership. And so I'm very thankful that prior to my arrival at Briar, you were fortunate enough to have thought about that and to have done the research and the hard work of making the decision to, to bring a command officer on to help guide us. Because I think that's just gonna be very instrumental when we come to full staffing, which I'm hoping to be middle of next month. And so with that, uh, there's this contract before you is much like the contract that you saw with mine. It's an executive exempt, uh, I think we call it uh, Mayor Paula, exempt. professional services contract, uh, right. not, not union. So this contract is very, very much identical to mine with you know the switching some words around. Um, as you will see in some of those key areas uh, when we that are probably more pertinent to what you all uh, would want to see in this lieutenant position is their uh, when will they work what what is their um, what will their business day look like and because the union agreed to go from six members down to five with the understanding that the lieutenant position would fill a patrol shift because there's no way to run 24 seven operation with five. So we have to have an even, even side three on the A side, three on the B side in order to filter through 24 seven operation. So the lieutenant will work hours that are not mine. He'll, he will work a swing shift hour um, during the week and that will allow for coverage to be extended into 
um, either 2 a.m. or 10 p.m., depending on what schedule that we're working. Because currently right now, we're working a non-contractual schedule. Um, because of our staffing shortage, uh, prior to my arrival as well, they, they are on a non-contractual schedule. So right now, until we get to full staffing, uh, the lieutenant will work a 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. schedule. And when we revert back to our contractual schedule, it will be a uh, excuse me, uh, noon to 10 p.m. So that, that gives, especially on this one, this gives a quite a bit of an overlap of coverage in the leadership side of things. So um, I think that's the main thing that I know that talking with Councilman Nick, uh, what is, uh, is an item that it was, was very important to you, that we would not be working the same hours, uh, the, myself and the, and the Lieutenant working the same hours, therefore, you know, in the in the evening, there's no leadership out there. Uh, some of this does have to do with uh, some of the state le legislation that is out there talking about having supervisory coverage at an agency. We do fall into a category of less than 10,000 population where, because some cities can't have 24 hour coverage and we are one of those. So how that the legislation made an exemption for those that are 10,000 and under, as long as there is a process, a policy in place for an officer that's on duty that requires a supervisory decision, they have the ability and which is call. And that's why I have a take home phone uh, that is on 24 seven. I probably should turn it off because I know these are like computers they kind of need to reset themselves, but it never turns off. And the same thing will be with Lieutenant. So we will be alternating our on-call schedules with one another. So the, the burden of, of always having to, you know, make sure you're, you're available is not just on one person. I think that not only does this help with, you know, myself and the Lieutenant coming on, but it also will give him some, some um, additional responsibility, but yet career building uh, possibilities with some of these critical calls that come in at 2.03 in the morning. So uh, the contract before you is, uh, I think, well vetted. Um, again, since it's a command position, it's everything is pretty much the same as mine. And I hope, I hope that you, uh, you see it as such and be willing to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Nick. Questions? Wow. Couple, well, I have a couple. I was getting others. Go ahead, one, Martin. First one, uh, in this salary, uh, it said that there is a cost of living increase, no less than one, no more than three. Uh, based on the way it's written, it looks like that's discretionary to administration. Is that accurate? I don't see any COLA or anything that's being tied in. No, that is the COLA. That's the that that's standard in all of our personal service contracts. Because I, I like I was thinking yeah. I had to go back and mind because we did a little different for the last time on the police thing, but it it, it was yeah. always the based on what X Y Z was, but you know the, I, there was always that statement. Yeah. This didn't seem to have that statement. Yeah, that's why I was wondering. It, it it doesn't have that because it it's based on the cola. It's not less than one. It's not more than three. Okay. Um, current. Currently, of course, as if any of you have looked it up, you'll see that yeah. the COLA for last year was much greater than yes, 3%. Yeah. Uh, we, will, we will run into that issue when we um, do our labor contracts in the next couple of years. So, All right, cool. Um, yeah, I saw the sever termination, eight, two months, that was pretty standard. Um, and then just curious, where is, uh, where is Officer Riddup currently employed? He, he is not employed. Okay. Well, he's employed. He's self-employed. Sorry. Self-employed. He's employed. So the last apartment he was in? Snoqualmie. And he uh, was one of those that took the choice to leave, was it? Or was he terminated? For... He, right. He was terminated. Okay. 
because of that, yes. Other questions? Looks okay to me. Because he had command responsibility before Nick, I, I noticed he was a 2016 graduate from the academy, so he's he's had one position prior to this. Uh, he so his entire time has been at Snoqualmie. His leadership has been uh, they have they have positions called OICs, officer in charge. So he's been uh, he had been assigned as an officer in charge probably three plus years. And then he also was an acting sergeant uh, with okay. Snoqualmie. Okay. So you're familiar with him, you've worked with him and you've got a level of comfort of, okay. I've, I've, known, I've known Chad his entire career. Okay. Good to know. Seal of approval. And the Lieutenant position is a bit of a training situation as well anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 I know that you guys, he's going to capture you guys. He's, he's very outgoing. He's a, uh, he's a very well-spoken and um, has, because he's older, as far as like coming into law enforcement, he was older. A lot of times, obviously that comes with, you know, some maturity on your back. So him bring, coming into law enforcement at a, at a later age than what is normal he has adapted very well to being a police officer and being able to read things and making very wise and educated decisions. When do you anticipate he'd be available to begin? Well, this is going to go to council on the 12th. Okay. And uh, I have to talk to Paula about what is best timing for HR for a person to start. Okay. Um, soon thereafter. So that, that's yet to be decided. Thank you. He's completed all of his hiring process. So uh, the mayor is, um, has that helm. Yeah, and I've, I've spent some time with him and um, looks like a great fit for our city. And plan, or as far as future planning, um, I'm, yes, I'm very, very excited about this position and the person. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all. And again, if you have further questions, please um, give our chief a call or send him an email. Um, but this is an important position for our city, but we're excited about it. And um, we've done a lot of things tonight. I appreciate the input. If you have any further questions, please reach out to staff or myself. If there's nothing else, we will see you in a week. All right. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Nick. Thanks, thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Be safe. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Sure, I'm here for the whole thing and not a single person. Thanks, Paul. Love you, Paula. Thanks a lot, guys. I see You're how the I best. You are you are glue, Paula. <laughs> I just I just had to give y'all a bad time because <laughs> you said thanks to every other staff member but me. <laughs> we love ya. Have a good night, everybody.